Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay, the first thing I do is drop the mic, but uh, that's okay. Thank you so much. I don't have a PowerPoint uh, presentation. I was once told that as a Muslim woman, I have too much direct eye contact. What they don't know is that without my glasses, I can't see you, and if I wear them, I can't read my notes, so you'll just have to bear with me. So I'm here to speak to you about this very newly formed uh, reform movement, which is uh, what I was asked to do. And um, the word reform is quite loaded uh, and very controversial for many reasons, because um, Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, also thought that he was bringing about a reform. And now, uh, much to our horror, the Muslim Brotherhood calls itself a moderate group. So be careful when you're looking for moderate Muslims. And Abdul Wahab, the founder of Wahhabism, also said that he was bringing about a reform. So I must clarify that I am not speaking for all Muslims, but I'm speaking for liberal progressive, reform-minded Muslims who understand that reform is one of the solutions and antidotes to the terrorism that we are seeing around us. We are not trying to reform the scripture, but we are trying to reform the way Muslims interpret, understand, and implement Islam in their lives. After decades of trying to battle the so-called war against terrorism uh, with weapons, I believe that the world has finally really realized that this can only be done by engaging the very same progressive, liberal, reform-minded Muslims. You will appreciate and understand that the violent aspects of Islamic teachings, some of which we have heard in the last two days, have to be understood in a different light and the narrative has to be changed before any possible change can be expected in the lives of those Muslims who are leaning towards radicalization. Very importantly, the hate that is taught at a very young age in madrasas needs to be openly challenged. Now, uh, the can <clears throat> thank you. Canadian uh, Senator David uh, Daniel Lang, who has been working on counterterrorism uh, proposals, told delegates at a public uh, conference recently, and I quote, we need to recognize that radicalized thoughts lead to radicalized actions. So we have to target the ideology that leads to radicalization. Now, as reform-minded Muslims, this doesn't mean that Muslims can't follow their faith. It just means that the secondary texts need to be questioned openly and honestly, honestly, and religion, Islam as a faith, needs to be seen through the lens of human rights and not the other way around. Unfortunately, as Muslims, we have done disservice both to humanity and our faith. And for example, the following notions are justified through certain aspects of Sharia and various hadiths, which is secondary, common, uh, secondary commentary, and this is what we need to tackle in the reform movement. The killing of apostates, beating, beating women and stoning women to death for adultery. By the way, all this is justified through aspects of Islamic law. Calling Jews pigs and monkeys. Declaring war on non-Muslims to spread Islam after offering non-Muslims three, uh, three options to subjugate to Islam, pay jizya, a humil humiliating tax, or be killed. Enslaving female war prisoners and taking them as sex slaves, as ISIS has been doing regularly. Fighting and killing Jews before the end of days, and killing of, of gays. So undermining these embedded ideologies is just the start of our challenge. I am very glad to be here because Israel is the only country in the world that understands what radicalization and terrorism is about because you deal with it on a daily basis. So the idea of reform is just starting to, to, to take root. It will be slow and it will be painful and we can't do this on our own. So we have put out an open invitation and invited everyone to join us, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim, because what we are dealing with is a global jihadist insurgency. 
The first aspect of reform for us is to bring Islam and Muslims into the 21st century, to stand for respectful, merciful, and an inclusive interpretation of Islam. We are in a battle for the soul of Islam, and an Islamic renewal must defeat the ideology of Islamism or political Islam, which seeks to create an Islamic state as well as an Islamic caliphate. We support the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, although we know that the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Conference, a large bloc at the United Nations Human Rights Council, is the caliphate. The reform movement rejects interpretations of Islam that call for any violence, social injustice, and politicized Islam. Facing the threat of terrorism, intolerance, and social injustice in the name of Islam, we have reflected on how we can transform our communities based on three principles, peace, human rights, and secular government. If we want peace, we need to reject the notion of armed jihad. And I want to explain this to you. In the seventh century, armed jihad existed as a notion, as a value, because there were no nation states, there were no boundaries, there were no United Nations. These were tribal communities who only knew how to deal with each other with warfare. So armed jihad at that time was acceptable. But today in the 21st century, we need our religious leadership and our scholars to park the notion of armed jihad in the seventh century. This is why we call my organization Muslims Facing Tomorrow and not looking back in the seventh century. So this is one of the really important factors that we need to do, we need to have. We need to light a fire under the feet of our religious leadership to make sure that this happens. And when I said this on the BBC Hard Talk interview, the interviewer looked at me and said, oh, so you like to light fires. And I thought, well, either light a fire now or be burnt in the future because we have to do this. <clears throat> Thank you. We believe that we must target the ideology of violent Islamist extremism. We don't hold back in political correctness or to say that there isn't, it isn't an Islamist extremist ideology. It is. We need to do this in order to liberate individuals from the scourge of oppression and terrorism, both in Muslim majority societies and in the West, because terrorism, as you all know, is a byproduct of radicalization. The reform will stand for the protection of all people of all faiths and those of no faith because we seek freedom from dictatorships, theocracies, and Islamist extremists. As reformists, we reject bigotry, oppression, and violence against all people based on any prejudice, including ethnicity, gender, language, belief, religion, sexual orientation, and gender expression. This means that we speak out very clearly against anti-Semitism. By the way, our organization is already involved in it, and one of the groups that works with us in the Muslim reform movement is called Muslims Against Anti-Semitism. That sounds good, or doesn't it? <laughs> As reformists, we reject bigotry, oppression, and violence on all people. We already said that. We support equal rights and dignity for all people, including minorities, keeping in mind that Muslim minorities have been heavily persecuted in Muslim lands. I'm originally from Pakistan, where both Muslim and non-Muslim minorities have been persecuted, and the world has been silent about it. I went to the United Nations, and I attended a session that was being held about the persecution of Christians in Pakistan, and I went there hoping that they will find a solution. And you will not believe what the topic of discussion there was. It was the Middle East conflict totally unrelated to the oppression of minorities in Pakistan. But that is how it's used as a tool to divert the conversation from really, really important issues. The Muslim reform rejects tribalism, castes, monarchies, and patriarchies, and considers all people equal with no birth rights other than human rights. All human beings, we believe, are born free and equal, 
in dignity and in rights. And we believe that Muslims don't have an exclusive right to heaven, although the jihadists' pension for, pension for 72 virgins is well known to everyone. I personally believe that there is only one 72-year-old virgin waiting for the jihadists. <laughs> <clears throat> A personal uh, favorite aspect of the reform, which I worked on uh, very closely, is equal rights for women, including equal rights to inheritance, witness, work, mobility, personal law, education, and employment. Men and women have equal rights in mosques, and by the way, some of us who are the more adventurous activists in the Muslim reform movement went to the Saudi-funded mosque in Washington, D.C. with our declaration. We were nearly arrested, but we prayed in the main men's section for the first time in the history of that mosque. If you go to the Muslim reform movement Facebook page, you can see a video about this. So the, we definitely reject sexism and misogyny. And in this regard, the good news is that in the, recent, in the last year, there are women-run mosques that have come up in Los Angeles, in Copenhagen, in London. And the day I win the lottery, there will be a women-run mosque in Canada as well. Uh, we are for secular governance, and I need to clarify this because people who are observant religious people get their backs up with the word secular. The idea is that the government should not uh, uh, interfere in the religious rights of people. And Abdullah al-Naimi, who is a, a great scholar in Islam and a, a legal expert, has said that Muslims can only practice Islam freely when they, have, when they live under a secular governance because there is so much diversity and a certain particular dogma is not forced on them. We believe in democracy and liberty. We are against political movements in the name of religion anywhere in the world. We are strongly loyal to the nations in which we live and we reject the idea of the Islamic State. There is no need for an Islamic caliphate. We oppose institutionalized Sharia because it is man-made. And here the clarification is that Sharia as personal law is all right, but Sharia as governance or as a parallel system of law in any Western country needs to be rejected. The reform promotes that every individual has the right to publicly express criticism of Islam. Now, I say this with a pinch of salt. I don't want all of you to stand up and start criticizing. But ideas do not have rights. Human beings have rights. We reject blasphemy laws. They are a cover for restriction of freedom of speech and religion. And we speak out against the multi-billion dollar marketing of the concept of Islamophobia, which is to silence all of you. So we encourage criticism. We affirm every individual's right to participate equally in critical thinking, and we look for a revival of ishtihad, which is the reason and logic that was lost in Islam in the older centuries. In this new movement in the 21st century, we need to have critical thinking. And most importantly, we encourage Muslims to look inwards and to reflect on how we have gotten to where we are today. We believe in freedom of religion and the right of people to express and practice their faith or non-faith without threat of intimidation, persecution, discrimination, or violence. Apostasy is not a crime, and I say this with feeling, because in my native land of Pakistan, people have been killed for blasphemy laws and for apostasy. Our ummah, our community, is not just Muslims, but all of humanity. We stand for peace, human rights, and respect. And the good news is that the reform has already started. There is a Facebook page. There is a website. We launched it at the Press Club in Washington, D.C. at the beginning of this year. We have invited everyone to join us. I invite all of you to work with us because this is not something we can do alone. In all honesty, perhaps we won't see the change in my lifetime, but every movement starts with the seed of change, and we have sown those seeds of change. Our future generations, our children and grandchildren, will hopefully pick this up 
and run with it because it is really the only solution to have an alternate narrative to name and shame the radical jihadists for what they have done to our faith and to provide an alternate for our young people who are being radicalized by the dozens and by the hundreds. Now, I was promised that if I finish my talk in time, we would be have space for questions. I don't know. You are the boss. Uh, can I take a couple of questions? I'm afraid we can't. Okay. Time. Well, I'll be here later on. If any of you have questions, one I'll be here. One question. Okay. Well, he's the boss. He's the boss. No. <laughs> Actually, he's also a Lieutenant Colonel, but, but he's also a boss. Okay. How do we clone you? <laughs> if you ask my husband that, he'll say one of her is enough. <laughs> so, um, thank you. That, that's really wonderful. But uh, so I'm here just to give you hope. Uh, in very dark times. And uh, this is my little ray of hope. Tomorrow I'll speak about the problems. So thank you very much. <laughs>